Earth's final warning. A topic of discussion in regards to what the information is that we've uncovered so far. We started off in the very first lecture on asking, is it the end of the world? Does that idea even exist? Is it a possibility? And after that, we've gone through various gulps of information to try and absorb and understand what on earth is going on in this war and deception. We started off on the Bible, and then we took off and we went into uncovering these deceptions which Satan has got laid out for humanity in various areas, from the pagan religions through to the Christian denominations, through to business, through to uh, politics, you name it. There's a net of deception waiting to swallow up the whole population. Now, Earth's final warning is a call which comes from heaven. And it's built on the, the three angels' messages which we covered yesterday. You remember that these were three heavenly messages which go, to our, go out into the world in Revelation and they warn the world about a final judgment that's about to take place. Do you remember what those three angels' messages were? Let's cover them again. Let's go through them and make sure that it's understood. And I want you to absorb it or read it, understand it, and try and figure out how does this pertain to me in my life. Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7. It was regarding the everlasting gospel. You remember this angel was ha that had the everlasting gospel? What was the everlasting gospel? It was the truth of Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world. The Old Testament sanctuary being fulfilled in the New Testament Christ. Not only that, we recognize that there were two pillars that were needed. When it comes to Christ, we always have this need or this recognition that when it comes to Christ, there are always two pillars needed. Not just one. Here are the patience of the saints, it says. These are the people that are going to make it to heaven. This, mm, this uh, figure of 144,000, which is not a literal figure, as we've discussed. And they have two characteristics. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Today we see a lot of Christianity, or uh, most of Christianity, that uh, has the faith or the testimony of Jesus Christ, but they don't keep the Ten Commandments. And you see, this is the problem, is this idea of righteousness by grace without any works is what is being propagated into the world. And it's being overemphasized that the law has been removed. It has not been removed. And we've shown that over and over and over. In this first angel's message, we also saw that the hour of his judgment is come. There was something to do with judgment that was happening. Now we know that the world hasn't come to an end yet. So this judgment is not a, an earthly final judgment. It's got to do with a process that's going on in heaven, which we'll get to a bit later. At the same time, you've got worship the Creator. Do you remember that? This call, worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. This call from heaven, please remove yourself from this idea that you've evolved into or from something and towards God. This is not from God. I created you, dong, and there you are. And I can switch you off, dong, and there you're gone. And that judgment is about to take place in the whole world. The second angel's message was Revelation 14 verse 8. Do you remember it? It covered a subject about Babylon that was fallen. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And this Babylon had two main aspects or found foundational beliefs. The first one was the belief in the spurious Sabbath. You remember that? The wrong Sabbath, the incorrect Sabbath. And secondly, that the, the foundation was the immortality of the soul. That opens the door to, to the New Age movement. It opens the door to evolution. The immortality of the soul is a lie, as we've explained, that started in the Garden of Eden. Mystic Babylon is split up into three segments. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we went into the dragon and we showed you the dragon and how he's being represented today in the media, but in signal pictures, silently underneath undercurrents that are taking place. Not only that, we spoke about the Antichrist beast. We showed you how the Antichrist beast has come up and is reigning today. And then how the false prophet, false Protestantism, especially from America, is taking this, these 
these uh, experiences and these feelings about what is right and what is wrong in your connection and your association with God. It's taking this into the world and it's confusing people to get involved in experiences and they're relying now on their feelings instead of the word of God. The second angel also warns about all the nations of the world drinking from the wine of the wrath of this woman, this church's fornication. Very hard message. And then the third angel's message from Re Revelation 14 verse 9 to 12. If you haven't read it, read it quickly before you read it with me. Pause it. And let's just remember what it was ab all about. This section was about worship specifically. And over and over and over I've said through these lecture series, the war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels was about worship. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will sit in the sides of the north. I will raise myself above the stars of God. I, I want the worship, right? So this war continues and today on earth, Satan has this idea of wanting to be worshipped. And his way of being worshipped is through sun worship or some element of sun worship. And he's deceiving people into receiving the seal, the mark of authority of his sun worship system. Where God is going to seal his people with his Sabbath worship system. Do you remember this? We've discussed this in length in the previous lecture. And this third angel's message warns if you worship the beast in his image, you will receive his mark in your forehead or in your hand. Whereas the law in the, the character of God is written in the forehead and the frontlets between your eyes and in your actions. Remember, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. And then you have both in line with the will of God, you receive the seal of God. If you have one that's either in line with God and one that's in line with Satan, you receive the mark of the beast. And that's how people are going to be deceived into receiving the mark of the beast. All the mark of the beast is it's an acknowledgement of the worship by which you go. In other words, if you are bowing down to some form of sun worship in any form whatsoever, even if it's just relating to the day in which you bow down to Jesus Christ, you're involved in sun worship. And that's why you either get the seal of God or it says if you worship um, the beast or, or Satan, you'll get his seal. Or if you worship God, you'll receive his mark in your forehead and your hand. And those that receive the mark of the beast will drink of the wrath of God, the wine of the wrath of God. These are very hard words warning about the future. And again, here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those two have to work together. It doesn't say here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that have the testimony of Jesus Christ or here are they that have the faith of Jesus Christ. No, it speaks about keeping the commandments. The same as Revelation 22 verse 14, which has been changed in the new Bibles. Blessed are they that keep my commandments, that keep his commandments, that they may have access to the tree of life. It now says, blessed are they that wash their robes. I'm still trying to find out how. Is it with um, bleach or with Omo or Skip or what detergent should I use? The theologians today have convinced themselves that it's got to do with referring to washing it in the blood of the Lamb. Well, I don't think you or I have got the right to fiddle in the Bible to change the received text and acknowledge the, the Sinaiticus text or one of the other false texts that have come through time. Revelation 18 verses 1 to 3 speak about a loud cry that comes from heaven. A scream, as it were, of the heavenly powers warning mankind, please be careful of the false systems of worship. And I've said again over and over through these lectures, if you find out that some of this information is cutting a little bit close to the bone, please realize and understand that the Lord is not rebuking you. He's rebuking the false system of worship in which you find yourself. He's calling every person to come in unity in truth, but out of this unity in error by which the world currently goes. He's calling each one of us to come out. And Revelation 1, 18 verse 1 to 3 says the following. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In the Bible, you have this representation of God's church being his bride. The woman, the righteous woman, the pure woman, the woman that is not defiled by false doctrines. You also have this representation of uh, the, the text that we read where it says, I'm not defiled with woman. In other words, other false systems of worship, other churches. And here comes the scream from heaven, this loud cry that says, Babylon, that great whore that sits on the mountains, the woman that rides the beast, Babylon, that church, that false system of worship, has fallen, has fallen. But that false system of worship, and listen to what these words say, this is so loud and hard and heavy on the heart. Listen to what it says. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And that church, that worship system, has become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Man, these are hard words. Your system of worship, if it's somehow related to the Roman power, the Roman Catholic system, these, the, what the Bible is saying that these systems of worship have filtered out and now Babylon has fallen at the end of time because it's become the habitation of every foul spirit and every foul bird and the habitation of devils. And the, the interesting thing, the way this Bible, the Bible writes it once this way and once that way, what was depicted as a dove descending from heaven when Jesus was baptized? It was the Holy Spirit, right? So here the Bible is warning that Babylon, the religious systems of the world have become the habitation of devils. So the experiences that you might have might feel right, but it's not right. Not only that, these religious systems have become the habitation or the hold of every foul spirit. It's another way of writing it. And then they write it again and it says, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Wow, these are hard words. Not only that. It's not this little group here in, in Europe that have done this because it continues, it says, for every nation has drunk, or all nations, it says, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants, those are the big bankers and the big um, business leaders of the world are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Ellen White writes that the message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them and they united fierce, fearlessly proclaiming the third angel's messages. You see, here's this call that we have, warning the world about this third angel's message, this loud cry, which includes in it the additional mention of the corruptions that have entered the church since when? 1844. Here's this mystical date of 1844. Where does this date of 1844 come about? I'll get into that just now. Revelation 18 continues in verse 4. It says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. This is the cry that goes out, Please, my people, Israel, the, where Israel in the Old Testament was a typology of the Israel of the end, where Egypt was an habitation of all these foul spirits and pagan religions, the sun worship system. Come out of her, be separate. Israel, send Moses into the world and call Israel to come out of Egypt. And there's going to be certain plagues that are going to fall on Egypt to warn Egypt that they are in sin. But they won't listen and they won't listen and they won't listen and then the door will close and then they'll receive the plagues. Give them the opportunity, go and speak to the Pharaoh, go and speak to him, but warn him that they must come out of 
Israel, they must, uh, Egypt, the Israelites must come out. That's a typology of the end. Today, this loud cry goes out. The Moses message goes into the world and says, come out of Egypt, the foul systems of worship. Anything to do with the pagan type sun worship religions, get away from it. Run for the hills if you have to. But come out and be separate. And guess what? There's going to be plagues. 120 years it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. That this message of righteousness by faith is going to be preached. And then one will be taken and one will be left. And another one will be taken and another one will be left. A typology again and again and again of the Bible warning us about the end time. But these truths are being covered up. And Rick Warren says, don't worry about prophecy. Jesus told us it's none of your business to worry about what's happening in the future. That's a lie. You see, the Old Testament sanctuary depicts for us what's happening in the heavenly sanctuary. This Old Testament tabernacle that was given to Moses is a perfect representation of not only the fulfillment of the various uh, ceremonies on earth through Jesus Christ, but also what would happen in the heavenly sanctuary. And that's one of the biggest messages of today is that the world needs to hear the sanctuary message. Because I think that the only message in the world has been the old tabernacle message in the Old Testament. No. The Old Testament tabernacle is pointing towards the heavenly tabernacle. Do you remember Hebrews 4 verse 14? It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Where is Jesus the high priest? Where is he the high priest? On earth? No, he wasn't part of the tabernacle system, the sanctuary system on earth. He was crucified outside. So where is the sanctuary? Well, let's read Hebrews 8 verse 1 and 2. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Let me paraphrase it. We have such a high priest in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So the one on earth was pitched by Moses, by man. The one in heaven was pitched by whom? Well, it wasn't pitched by man. So this earthly tabernacle is pointing to the heavenly tabernacle. And all the feasts and the, the ceremonies associated to the earthly tab tabernacle have a reason for being there. Some of them are fulfilled through Jesus Christ here on earth and some of them are fulfilled through Jesus Christ in heaven. The Old Testament sanctuary shows us that the gospel we have on earth today is the same gospel that we have in the Old Testament. Not only that, it helps us understand God's plan of salvation. You see, in the Jewish calendar, a year was seen as an entire cycle. So in type versus anti-type, which I'll get to now, the, a year or a full cycle in the Jewish calendar would represent the full cycle of the entire Christian era. And you had the four main festivals, which were the Passover, the unleavened bread, the first fruits and the feast of weeks. And those were fulfilled in Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus in the grave, Jesus' resurrection, and the Pentecost harvesting of souls. Those four in the Old Testament sanctuary were fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. An example of this, as we've said in previous lectures, we've explained how Jesus was preparing or the Sanhedrin had condemned him to death four days before his crucifixion. The same way that the Passover lamb was called into the house four days before the Passover feast. And that as the priest was busy in the old Jewish system, busy killing or about to uh, perform the sacrifice of this lamb, Jesus was being crucified outside the city. And that there was an exact typology. Not a bone of the Passover lamb was allowed to be broken. Not a bone of Jesus' body was allowed to be broken or was broken. And just the way the, the lamb was put on a spear or a, a skewer to be able to roast it, so Jesus Christ had a spear to test if he was still alive. It was These typologies are incredible, type versus anti-type. You see, the lamb was the type, the anti-type was Jesus Christ. And when they met, there was a huge earthquake and the curtain ripped from top to bottom, allowing mankind now to approach the Holy of Holies directly because the sanctuary system had been done away with. So the four Old Testament festivals are a shadow of things to come. 
And they are then fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And there were three other main festivals. You had the Feast of Trumpets, the Atonement, and the Tabernacle. And the question we need to ask is, how do they get fulfilled? Where is the fulfillment of those? If the first four were through Jesus, how do those become fulfilled? And in order to do that, I need to go back right to lecture number two. Who is God? We asked. God, who are you? Are you Vishnu? Are you Krishna? Are you Shiva? Are you Brahma? Are you Buddha? Are you Allah? Are you the cosmic Christ, the Maitreya? Who are you? And Jesus Christ came and showed us who he was. And in that lecture, we saw the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. I like to recap that, but do you remember it was part of a bigger prophecy? Let's complete that prophecy now and see how it goes. Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Do you remember this, this uh, prophecy? 2,300 days? We didn't know when it started. We didn't know when it ended. We just knew, bomb, 2,300 days. A period of time, a block of time in history, something would happen. Daniel continues in his writings in verse 17. He said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for that the time of the end shall be the vision. So this 2,300 days has got something to do with the end of time. And then it continues in Daniel 9.24. Of that 2,300 days, I want you to take 70 weeks and do something with it. Remember that? Let's read it. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end to sins and make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and the prophets and anoint the most holy. So there we have the 70 weeks out of the 2,300 days. And then it says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And it says in verse 26 and 27, After threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Then he shall confirm a covenant for many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. This was the, the prophecy that we went through in such detail in the previous lecture. Can you remember the key to unlocking this is where it explains in Ezekiel 4 verse 6 and Numbers 14 verse 34 that we have to take one day for a year when speaking prophetic language. You have to look at a day and say, right, 2,300 days, well, that must be 2,300 years. If you don't know what I'm speaking about, go and get the lecture. You'll, you'll find out exactly all those texts are in there. And it says from the, the decree to restore and, and rebuild Jerusalem is the starting trigger of this 2,300-day prophecy, including the 70 weeks. And we went into Wikipedia and we saw 457 BC was a decree of Artaxerxes I to reestablish the city government of Jerusalem. So bang on time, there we have the start of this 70-week prophecy. In 27 AD, we saw that Jesus was baptized. Three and a half years later, we saw that Jesus was crucified. And three and a half years later, we saw that Stephen was stoned. So we were able to look at the entire 70-week prophecy and realize that Jesus is showing before the time, many, 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 many years before, exactly when he's going to come, where he's going to come, and how he's going to come. Then in Daniel 8 verse 14, it says, But unto 2,300 days... Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And for many years, people wondered, what does this mean, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed? Because if you calculate one day equals one year, when you're speaking prophetically, then 457 BC plus 2,300 days, meaning 2,300 years, comes to a date of 1844. Remember for a moment that there's no zero year. It goes minus three, minus two, minus one, one, two, three. There's no zero. So when these prophecies were predicted they, or, or worked out, they didn't realize there was no zero year. And they came up with a date of 1843. And this idea of 1843, people realized that the sanctuary would be cleansed. And there was this message that went out to the world to worship the creator of heaven and earth, where this message was was broadcast, if you like, 
people call it the Millerite movement, you can call it what you want. There was for the first time in history a recognition of this 2300 day prophecy where 1843 was the acknowledgement that the sanctuary would be cleansed. In other words, earth would come to an end in 1843. But that's in a slight contradiction to the rest of the Bible because the Bible says, no man knoweth the hour of the day. So they said, well, we don't know the hour of the day. We just know it'll be in that year. But then when they recalculated because Jesus didn't come and the earth wasn't ended, they didn't say, well, God changed his mind. They said, well... Maybe we misunderstood. Let's go back to the Bible and check. And then they saw, ah, of course, there's no zero year. So the end of the world is going to be next year in 1844. And 1844 was then issued as the date when the Lord will come and fetch his own and the sanctuary of earth will be cleansed. And when that didn't happen, can you imagine how bitter these people got? They got so bitter some of them that they left this belief of trying to understand prophecy. But there were a few people that said, hold on a second. We misunderstood the first one when it spoke about 1843. Maybe we misunderstood the second one as well. You see, William Miller and the people that were with him, they got the date ro right, but they got the event wrong. 1844 was the date when the sanctuary would be cleansed. But at that time, they did not recognize yet the sanctuary on earth pointing towards the sanctuary in heaven. And the sanctuary cleansing process that took place was a critical event in this cycle of a single year in the tabernacle on earth. Because all the sins of the people would be pent up inside the sanctuary system. And then once a year they would have to cleanse the sanctuary and the high priest would go in and he would go through this ceremony of cleansing the sanctuary and once a year the sanctuary would be cleansed. In the bigger picture what this is pointing to is once in the entire cycle of earth's history the sanctuary which is in heaven will be cleansed. And this is explained in the New Testament interestingly enough in Hebrews 9 verses 1 to 12 and I've paraphrased it but if you read the whole thing you'll see what I mean. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So that's in the Old Testament. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That was the one Moses built. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So that was the holy of holies. This was all on earth. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Now listen. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Here was a New Testament reference pointing towards the Old Testament ceremony, where the priest was only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And if he walked into the Holy of Holies, if he went through the curtain, around the curtain, and he went into the Holy of Holies, and he did not have his sins cleansed or his sins removed, he would die immediately. Because he walked into the very presence of God, the Shekinah glory behind this thick curtain. That was the presence of the Almighty God. And once a, a year, he would go into the sanctuary, but not without blood. In other words, he would have to have something to atone for his sins. And then he would put all the sins of the sanctuary on the mercy seat and there the ceremony would take place. Let's read further in Hebrews 9 verses 1 to 12. It says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was still yet standing. So here you've got a confirmation that the Holy Spirit had not yet opened the way for into the tabernacle of the holiest of holies because the sanctuary was still there. The curtain had not been torn yet. This was in the Old Testament. Let's read on. But Christ being come a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. So this is another tabernacle. That is to say, not of this building which we've been referring to in the Old Testament. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, now careful here, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Once this 1843 didn't happen and 1844 didn't happen, 
And these scholars went back to study what they'd misunderstood in the word. They realized, oh. So the earthly sanctuary me is pointing towards the heaven. He's saying, oh, okay, so the heaven, I, I understand. So there's a sanctuary in heaven. And of course, that's where the throne of God is. That's in the sides of the north. Oh, this is starting to make so much sense. You got the Shekinah glory, you got the presence of God, you got the throne of God, you got the mercy seat, you got the law, you got it all in. Okay, so here the earthly one points towards the heavenly one. And the ceremonies on the earthly one pointed to certain things that were going to happen at specific times in the heavenly sanctuary. So here the high priest in heaven, just like the high priest on earth went once a year, once a cycle into the Holy of Holies. Here the high priest went once in the cycle of earth's history into the Holy of Holies. And the Hebrews says, not by the goat of um, uh, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy place. So here through the blood of Jesus Christ, that sacrifice, he enters into the holy place once in the entire cycle. So the high priest on earth is pointing towards the high priest in heaven. Now why is this all important? Well, you see the day of atonement was exactly that. Just split up the word atonement and you'll see it actually means at one mint. From the date that the first sin came into the world, man separated himself from God. Once a year in the sanctuary on earth, there was a point where man got back at one with God. And that was the point of, or the day of at one mint, atonement. This beautiful day was a ceremony which was held in the Old Testament. And on that great day, the high priest was the only minister of the sanctuary that could enter in and do the ceremony. He would go into the most holy place. And he would do so through the blood of certain animals that he took with him. Read this with me. On that great day of atonement, the only one that was to minister in the sanctuary on that day was the high priest. He would enter the most holy place. He had to do a special work of purifying himself. If he was impure, when he went into the sanctuary, he would die. And so all around the base of his robe, the Lord had directed that he was to put pomegranates. And between the pomegranates, bells, so that as he walked, they could hear those bells tinkling through the sanctuary. As the people out there were not able to participate, they had to hold on by faith to what was being done by the high priest. They listened to the tinkling of the bells. If those bells stopped for very long, it would mean that the high priest might have perished before the Lord. Once then the high priest had done atonement for himself, then the white linen ephod pure and clean was put on. At this point, with the ephod on, the priest stands before God as if he had never sinned. This process was when the high priest, nobody else could participate, only the high priest. And he would have pomegranates and bells on his, on his robe. And as he walked, it would jingle. And the people outside would listen to what the high priest was doing on their behalf inside the tabernacle. And they would have to have faith of what he was doing. In the same way, with this process, Jesus is in the sanctuary, in the, high, in the holy place after 1844. And we have to hold on by faith to what he's doing on our behalf. The Day of Atonement was interesting because there were two goats that had been chosen and were tied just outside the curtain of the sanctuary, waiting through all this for their part in the last final symbol of union between God and man and the end of sin. The high priest now in these new white robes went out and they cast lots over the two goats. One was chosen to be the Lord's goat and the other one was known as the scapegoat. The one was chosen to represent the devil and his name was Azazel. So two goats are brought into the sanctuary and they cast lots. And the lot falls on the one goat and he becomes the Lord's goat and the other one becomes Azazel. What to, that's where the word scapegoat comes from. It comes from the Old Testament sanctuary, the scapegoat. You also have this in Afrikaans, you've got the word sonderbok, the bok with the sin, the goat with the sin, the goat carrying the sin, sonderbok, scapegoat. Points to the Old Testament sanctuary. Here is the first representation or the explanation why every time Satan is depicted by the inside initiates, he's depicted as a goat. 
Remember Baphomet with his fingers up, fingers down, represented as the goat with the light on his head, with the goat's feet? Same representation on the temple of Freemasonry where they had the Ark of the Covenant being covered by the covering cherubs with goat's feet. We saw the same in the Jehovah's Witness manuals or the books where Jesus is depicted with goat's feet, all pointing towards the goat, the goat, the goat. Satan himself recognizing that he is, the devil is, Azazel, the goat. Even called the sabbatic goat, Baphomet is called the sabbatic goat by some like Occultopedia as an example. To this day, uh, the Hebrews use the name Azazel to represent the devil. And in uh, spiritualism and occult circles, he's known as Baphomet. So here you have this Azazel figure, the scapegoat coming in to the ceremony. And first he would take the Lord's goat and he would, offer, he would use the Lord's goat as a sin offering for himself the high priest now, and he would take that to, to represent him cleansing himself before the Lord. He would then take a second goat, and it says, he would then go out into the court and take the other goat, Azazel, and the priest would place his hands over the head of that goat, and he would confess all the sins that had come into the sanctuary. It symbolically represents that the sins had now been removed from their minds, their memories, and their lives, and now were transferred to the mind and the memory and the life of the devil. See, this is the point where um, the, the sanctuary gets the opportunity to be cleansed. The high priest kills the one goat as, a, as an offering in front of the Lord for his own sins. And then he goes to the other goat. He doesn't kill him. He puts all the sins in the sanctuary he, with through, through this uh, process onto this Azazel. And what happens then? A, a man would then lead this Azazel out into the wilderness usually a strong man, would be taken and he would walk this Azazel into the wilderness and he would be left out in the wilderness. And through this process, the sins were taken on the scapegoat out of the sanctuary and the sanctuary would be cleansed. This was done once every cycle on the day of at one the day of atonement. The sanctuary on earth would be cleansed. And they started to realize, but hold on a second, that's why the Lord didn't come to earth. Because it's not the earthly sanctuary that's going to be cleansed. It's the heavenly sanctuary. Because as we pray, Lord, please forgive our sins. Please. Because now we have the right to approach the throne of God directly. As we pray, forgive our sins, Lord. And these sins are placed inside the heavenly sanctuary. From the time of Jesus Christ, all sins are there inside the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary has to be cleansed. And the date given by the Lord is 2,300 days from 457 BC. There will be a process similar to what I've depicted to you on earth that will go on in heaven. And the day of at one will have come. And then Jesus will enter into the holy place, not with the blood of goats, but with his own blood to do atonement for us. Isn't that an absolutely beautiful depiction of the wonderful beautiful nature that is Jesus Christ. So from 457, we've got 70 weeks up to 34 AD. We've then got another 1810 years from then to 1844, this mystical date of 1844. Can you imagine this being predicted in the Word of God? Can you imagine how much Satan hates this uh, prophecy? Can you imagine how much he hates it? Not only does it depict Jesus in the, in the sanctuary of God, but it points to the destruction of all sin on earth as well as Azazel, the Baphomet, the scapegoat being led out into the wilderness. So in earthly service, the priest would only enter once. In heavenly circles, the same, the priest would only enter once, which is Jesus Christ. Here you have the images I've shown of the first four a type and then the, the fulfillment of those four as anti-type. In the Old Testament, those four ceremonies and feasts being a shadow of things to come, being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Tishri, uh, one which was the festival of the trumpets, atonement and the tabernacle, being fulfilled in the second advent movement, and then the atonement, the pre-advent judgment, and tabernacle is the second or advent or the homecoming. Now, why do I say that? Well, Trumpets, remember the heralding of a loud message, doo -doo, like war or some message going to the world? The message of trumpets. 
Well, this festival of trumpets was exactly that. It was the first time in history that a message went into the world, be careful, the end of the world is coming. And when they misunderstood, they realized they misunderstood it, they went back and studied scripture. And then they could herald a new message, which is the one we're doing at the moment. 1844, the moment when Jesus enters the Holy of Holies to, to uh, request the sins to be cleansed out of the sanctuary. And the one that we're waiting for is the final feast or festival as depicted in the Old Testament. The one of the tabernacles. This is the homecoming. This is the statue being hit on the feet in Daniel 2. This is the cornerstone coming out of heaven and crushing everything underneath it that doesn't belong to him. 1844 is this magnificent date when Jesus enters the Holy of Holies on our behalf for the first time and the only time in history. An absolutely beautiful type versus anti-type. The depiction of this the salvation, the plan of salvation as it is today and as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. This calling of come out of the world and be separate goes into the world. Not only that, at the same time you got the message of come in and be in unity with all of these people that are doing these horrible things. We saw the induction, the, the oath of induction of the Jesuit order. Do you remember it said, you've been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces and states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, enjoying the blessings and peace of peace to take sides with combatants and act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side. The Jesuit order was this order that was set up to go and destroy Protestantism. But when was it set up? Can you remember? 1734? Uh, 110 years prior to this beautiful date of 1844? Look what happens. It says the Roman Catholic Lafayette warned that it is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests. They have instigated most of the wars in Europe. Not only that, it says Popery, Puseyism and Jesuitism that the Jesuits aim for ruling the whole world. Come together. And in order to do that, remember what's the mystical date? 1844. Satan understands prophecy. He studies prophecy. We've seen that from the satanic high priest who told us. And here is this date coming closer and closer and closer. And he starts to excite things. When did America come into fulfillment or when was it acknowledged by France? 1798. How close are we to 1844? What happened around the same time? Remember the Jesuits say that they are in control or it is said that the Jesuits control and manipulate the world into these revelations. What happened around the same time? Well, just look at this graphic and you'll see. 1776, American Revolution. 1789, French Revolution. 1823, Spanish Revolution. 1831, Polish Revolution. 1848, 1848, Italian and German Revolution. Isn't that incredible? Around this mystical date of 1844, bam on time, come all these revelations where the world is starting to be driven to a one world order. Albert Pike wrote a letter in 1871. That's not even... That, excuse me, that's not even 30 years after this mystical date where Jesus in heaven enters the holy place. About how the first world war was to overthrow uh, the, the power of the, author, the Tsars in Russia and bring about an atheistic communistic state. That happened. He spoke about a second world war that would originate between Britain and Germany. And it would strengthen an, uh, the, the communism as, as an antithesis to Judeo christian culture and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. He also wrote 30 years after this ma magical date, almost 30 years, about a third world war that was to take place. And all of this was to drive mankind towards a one world order. And then the French Revolution at the same time, 1789, comes this new message of the French Revolution. Do you know what that message was? The first representation of human rights. Here's the graphic. You can see the Declaration of the French Revolution in 1798. And it's laid out as the Ten Commandments. 
in the same two tablets. In the middle, you've got the symbol of fascism. Above it, you've got the Yakubin hat. And just above that, you've got the serpent eating its own tail. And right above the top, you've got the Masonic triangle with the all-seeing eye. Here in 1798, this is what, 46 years before this mystical date, here Satan starts to call the world together. Under what? How is he calling the world together today? Human rights. What do we hear? God's law? God's law? Or do we hear on the TV every single day? Human rights? Human rights? Human rights? Satan is calling everybody together under the United Nations, under the European Union, under the African Union, under the, the World Council of Churches, under the religious parliament. At the same time, in the 1790s, 1800 period, early 1800s, you see the rise of Freemasonry, you see the rise of sp spiritualism, the rise of theosophy or the house of the Theosophical Society. You get the false prophets, you get the Mormon movement, you get the Jehovah's Witnesses, and you get the Christian Science movement. This is the attack, the demonic attack that is infiltrating the world since 1844. Not only that, what about Karl Marx? He joined the League of the Just in 18. 1842, which became later known as the League of the Communists. He even started writing his Communist Manifesto in when? 1844. This call to worship God as the Creator goes out in this loud cry from, from heaven. Interestingly, on 1844, smack on the button, Darwin starts or is penning together his ideas about the origin of species. It says there in his own book, after five years' work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject and I drew up some short notes. These I enlarged in 1844. Around the same time, here Darwin is putting together his false system of religion which I identifies the sun. He doesn't know what he's doing. I don't think he willingly and vindictively knew what he was doing. The Bible warns us that at that time, the various demonic attacks are going to start, and bam, right on time it happens. An interesting religion that started up around a similar time was the Baha'i faith. Here you see the Abdul or Adul Baha. The Baha'i faith was founded in what? 1844 by the Baha'u Allah, linking the faith with Baha'i faith founded by the Bab, meaning gate. He announced that he was the coming one in 1863. That's an interesting date I'll get into into the second half of this lecture. His son Ab uh, Abdul Baha was his successor. Here's another gate to God that is put together on earth. Another Bab. Not only that, if you look at their beautiful temple, you see there in Haifa, Israel, 13 June 2003, nearly one and a half million people have visited the garden terraces surrounding, surrounding the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel since it was first opened on 4 June 2001. Isn't that interesting? Look how beautiful it is, how it overlooks the sea. If you look at the, the board outside the temple, it says, the Baha'i faith upholds the fundamental unity of all religions, the independence investigation of truth, the equality of women and men, the elimination of prejudice, universal education, the establishment of an international auxiliary language, spiritual solutions to economic problems, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et the Baha'i faith, 1844, boom, this new religion goes out into the world. Not only that, in their own documents, and there you'll see it. I'm not going to read the whole page, but you can see they speak about this wronged one ever since the early days of his life cherished no other desire but this. This is about unity of the underneath the wronged one with a capital O. You know one, this, the one eye, the same one that we've seen over and over. This is Lucifer. And then they say in their own documents, Abdul Baha, he says, Whoever acts completely in accordance with the teachings of Christ is a Baha'i. I disagree. The purpose is the essential meaning of Christian, not the mere word. The purpose is the sun itself and not the dawning points. For th um, though the sun is one sun, its dawning points are many. We must not adore the dawning points, but worship the sun. We must therefore, we must adore the reality of religion and not blindingly cling to the appellation Christianity etc., etc., how we have to release ourselves from the bonds of this, this, uh, this fundamentalism. Same time, 1844, the, the Sinaiticus text is found on Mount Sinai in a waste paper basket, and that is the founding or the foundational documents which we find now today in all the modern texts of the Bibles. 
especially in the Douay Rheims online Bible, which is a good example of the difference of them. You just, just take, for example, the uh, RSV and read G Genesis 3 verse 15. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the way I understand it. What does the Douay Rheims Bible say? I will put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed and she shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. See the problem here? They're turning Christ into Mary, well, into the male into the female. Also at the same time, this mystical 1844, come these experiences of these Fox sisters where they start having these wrappings and the spiritualism starts up. 1848, March 31st, 1848, there's this recognition and finally that they can speak to the dead. Robert Miller said, who was the, um, involved in the United Nations at the top level, he says what the world needs today is a convergence of the different religions in the search for and definition of the cosmic or divine laws which ought to regulate our behavior on this planet. And today the United Nations uses the sun symbol with the, the, uh, the wreath and the sun, the, the Baal Hadad as their symbol. All together now we are the world. 50 years, 1945 to 1995. There's this image of Jesus Christ knocking on the United States or the United Nations trying to say, please let me in, please let me in. What you're doing is not right. Robert Muller knew about this image and he writes, there's this famous poster which shows Christ knocking at the tall United Nations building, wanting to enter it. I often visualize in my mind another even more accurate painting that of a United Nations would be the body of Christ. Well, it's not. It's not set up by Christ. Robert Muller said, my great personal dream is to get a tremendous alliance between all major religions and the United Nations. Not only that, he says, peace will be impossible without the taming of fundamentalism through a united religion that profess faithfulness only to the global spirituality and the health of this planet. You remember, inside the United Nations, there was a prayer room. And this prayer room points towards, well, if you look at it, you'll see that it's in the form of a, a pyramid without the cap. We've been through this and we've been through this and we've been through this. This is satanic, not godly. The meditation room faces north, northeast. To enter the room, you must proceed from darkness to light. Anton LaVey, the founder of the church and Satan, refers to the occult principle known as the law of the trapezoid. And that's the form in which this room takes, the, the trapezoid. Today, the United Nations bases all its teachings on Alice A. Bailey. She says, I'm preparing for the coming one. I have no other life intention, she, is, she says. And uh, Robert Muller explained that it wasn't humans that built the United Nations. It wasn't built by a human force. In other words, it was a su supernatural force. We're coming to momentous times in this world. This call goes out from heaven and the warning of the date of 1844 becomes clearer and clearer. We'll be continuing on this and I'll show you video clips of how all of these are coming together. But we'll do that in the second half.